And let's welcome Steve Hoy, the Points Whisperer, to your career podcast. Hi, Steve. Hi, Jane. Thank you for having me on. Oh, I'm so excited. I've wanted to talk to you for ages because using points, getting upgraded, those that those are things that everybody, you know, wants to do. And you've created this amazing business where uh, people can really save a lot of money and travel in style um, so very easily with your method. So we'll find out more about I Fly Flat a little bit later on. But as you know, on your career podcast, I always kick it off because we'd like to find out about your career journey and how you became the points whisperer. Let's kick it off with what were your early career aspirations when you were a little boy, Steve? Yeah, that's a really good question. When I think back when I was a little boy, I don't think I had any particular job in mind but I think I had an, an overall writing it's like I'm going to do things a little bit differently so while I didn't have sort of the traditional jobs because my, my father was a, was a chef and I wasn't planning to be a chef and actually I, I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible at cooking food so maybe I went completely the opposite way but I knew that I was always going to be doing something different and I always thought about things differently so maybe I had a, a mindset that it will be different but I guess at that point, I also knew that the job I would do probably didn't exist then. Mm -hmm. You so, know what's so interesting is so often when people want to do something different, they always come up with lots of different ideas. It's an early indication that they might be cut out for entrepreneurship, which is what you obviously are. However, at a young age, you would have had to finish school and study and get qualified. And so how did your career journey progress yeah i would say most of it the early stage it definitely just fell into it so when i was in high school i was i was pretty good at economics so excelled in economics uh did four unit maths so very good at numbers and logic and rational uh, but actually i remember when i was picking my course i was going to do for uni i, I was actually going to do psychology I was oh. so close to doing psychology. My friends went to do accounting uh, because one of my best friends, his father was an accountant. So he was going down the accounting path. And for me, I was like, oh, accounting, oh, it seems a bit boring, but psychology seems interesting. Until one point where I pulled out one of those um, salary guides and I looked up psychology and I looked up accounting. I thought, no psychology for me. I think it's the <laughs> way to go. So, uh, so it back. was the dollar carrot that got you. <laughs> yes, Actually, it's yes. interesting, isn't it? Because um, our early career influences, it depends on what our values are and what really drives you. But obviously, when you were younger, then you thought, OK, if I'm going to spend that many years getting qualified in something, I'd like to get paid earlier. <laughs> Yes, or paid more a little bit earlier as well. And so, yeah, that that absolutely makes sense. But, you know, what was it about psychology that drew you initially? I think it's it's just about really like sort of observing people's behaviours and what drove them and why they did this, why they did that. So I still, obviously, in, in a way, that links in very well with entrepreneurship because mm -hmm. the product you're selling is always about that. Maybe I'm still overthinking a lot, but I, I quite enjoyed sort of the understanding part. But maybe I, I, I definitely know I made the right decision not to do it because I think if you do it, it gets really into the detail and that might lose a bit of the charm around it. So I think my entrepreneurship employing the psychology mindset is probably the perfect scenario. Yeah, I, th I think actually it would be right because with what you do, there's so much of psychology in it as well because you have to understand your customers and your clients and what really draws them, what motivates them, what makes them do A versus B. And those are the sorts of analytics that you need when you're running your own business. But so you went into accounting and so did you enjoy it? Yeah, I quite Quite, quite enjoyed it. I think it matched very much my sort of like my skill set in, in economics and maths because accounting is a bit like, like that. But de definitely in the, in the first couple of years at university, I did struggle a little bit through getting all the concepts. Uh, but I, I graduated uh, with no problem. And actually, I do remember in my very first job, I was doing some accounting work. And then at that point, something clicked and I thought, oh, that's how you do it. So I learned it at uni, but I didn't apply it to it. Actually, one day at work, and it's like, oh, 
this all makes sense now. So mm-hmm. I, I think I excelled pro, very well. But then, interestingly enough, I'm not an accountant. I, I'm, in, I'm an accountant, but I don't do accounting anymore. So I also then left that because I didn't feel that was sort of like different enough. There's so many accountants in the world already. Uh, so I don't need it to be another one. And I've looked on your LinkedIn profile, of course, because it's, you know, a really interesting journey. And now, before you transitioned into entrepreneurship, you were head of accounting operations for global financial services at the Macquarie Group. Um, Did you start your career at the Macquarie Group? Or was there something else that happened earlier? Yeah, there's two other jobs. My very first job at our uni, when all my friends went to do uh, accounting firms, I went to a wholesale travel agency. And, and in a way, that, that's the linkage back to what I do now. Because I discovered in that in that job, in that travel agency, that there's different prices for everything. In a way, everyone paid a different price for their seat. And it's most intriguing to me because everyone's going to the same place. But they pay different prices because depending on when they bought the ticket, who they bought the ticket through. So that opened my eyes that the travel industry is this big, wide, complex beast. So I, I worked there for a year and a half. And then my second job was at a home security alarm business, a much bigger company, operations in Australia, New Zealand, and America. Uh, did the accounting for that. Uh, and then I went to Macquarie. That's my third job. When I realized that I had to just get some blue chip, large company experience, whereas the first two companies were both, both small. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting when when people transition from one job to another, or else from one career path to another and make a bit of a pivot. How did you feel when you made each change? Did you feel anxious about it? Or did you embrace the change? Or did you find it challenging at all? Uh, I, I think that it was challenging, because when you're changing companies, you're going to a brand new environment uh, as well, different goals. But not too challenging because I, I knew that my skill sets were useful and that that's why they hired me. So I sort of slotted right in and then you sort of get into the culture. Uh, no, obviously, I didn't mind working hard. So even that the, the home security company, we were doing accounts and probably working to like midnight type thing. And I think that decision transitioned very well because when I did end up working with Corey, that's also a hard working company. So working late nights didn't faze me. Like even to this day, sometimes when I look at a clock, seven o'clock, that's not very late. But well, it actually is late. But when I was thinking back to my previous job, it wasn't like late at all. Yeah, that's right. You really have to put in the hard yards, don't you, in order to be successful. And there's nothing wrong with hard work. And in fact, you know, if you really apply yourself, whether you thrive in it and you think, oh, this is this is the the dream job or not, if you put in all of your energy and effort to excel then it's going to be a really good grounding for you uh, for future ventures whether it's in another role or actually getting into entrepreneurship so you had over 10 years at the Macquarie Group which is very impressive and then there was a change and that was about the time when you started I Fly Flat so can you tell us the story about you know leaving Macquarie Group which is you know a blue chip company so well known and then starting your own venture Adventure, did your family or friends or anyone think what are you doing <laughs> well actually I think I sort of had it easy so where I got the idea of freaking fly points was that we, we were with Macquarie I was going to India a lot to start the outsourcing team so therefore we can have an accounting outsourcing team in India I flew back and forth to New Delhi it was during that time that I flew business class for the very first time and I discovered that the ticket price was over seven thousand dollars, and I was like, "Wow, who pays for this?" And I slowly, every single trip, every time you fly, I started collecting frequent flyer points. And so, very quickly, my points added up, and I had enough points to fly business class to Singapore. And for me, that's when the coin dropped. It's like, well, if I was doing all these flights, it cost me nothing. I was collecting these points, and these points were valuable. If only I could get more freaking flyer points, then I could get more free flights. And that was when the interest started in investigating, researching, reading forums, reading blogs, reading everything about points. How do I get more points? Because more points equals more free flights. 
and in a way then that's how that led to i fly flat but i was quite fortunate in, in some in my eyes is fortunate but i actually got a redundancy from the mm-hmm. code so after 11 years uh, and Macquarie, uh, they were looking to downsize because it's just after the GFC. I put my hand up and I said, well, you know, if you're looking for people, I would like to be on, on that list. And then they gave it to me. I don't, I don't know if they were going to, but they said I was the happiest person that they ever told. <laughs> I didn't have a job. It's like, great. It matched yeah. both our needs. Yeah, I I really like that story because so many people are fearful about redundancy. And, you know, as, as you know, I'm a career transition coach, so I support people through career change. And for many people, they think, oh, no, a redundancy. What did I do wrong? Or will I ever get another job? But, you know, and a redundancy so often ends up being a blessing in disguise because it gives you this opportunity, especially if you're given um a decent redundancy package as well that gives you something to play with yes yeah. or to consider um but even if you aren't given a significant package it does give you time to rethink what you're doing in your career and whether it's important to you or not or what you really want to do next and so since this redundancy happened and you embraced it and you were the happiest man <laughs> Corey, to be given a redundancy <laughs> what what happened next did you take some time off did you travel did you use points I mean, what what did very, you do once that happened yeah very much so I took six months off mm-hmm. and initially it was, to, was to take three months off because mm-hmm. after working sort of 11 continuous years at a very busy place I'm required doing the counting jobs I knew that I was going to take a, take a minimum three months off they they pull you up with a agency to help you obviously to be redeployed and I was working with a really good um, person called Trish, and, and she helped me understand what my key skills were, not the role that I was doing in order to find that role. It was what, what I was really good at. And in, in those discussions, I discovered that I was really good at logical. I was really good at reasoning. I was really good at planning and numbers. With all that information coming through, I put my mind, I thought while I was traveling, yeah, okay, I could get another job. And I actually did come back and do a couple of interviews. But along the way, I was traveling using my points. And one of the most pivotal moments was when literally about 11 years ago, uh, 2012, the Tour de France and the Lum- London Olympics were on. And whilst you're right next to each other, geographical, I thought this is the perfect time to go to both events at the same time. So if we first cast over, I, I went to... Uh, Zurich and I went to Paris, France, London Olympics. And, and I, at that time I knew, well, if I could fly business class for nothing and I don't even have a job and I'm flying first class, business class, if I could help people do the same thing, there must be a business in that. Mm-hmm. And then that was the formation of I Fly mm-hmm. Flat. How wonderful. I mean, thank goodness for the redundancy. (laughs) And how fantastic that you got to go to the London Olympics virtually for free. Yes. (laughs) Just about. Well, of course, you'd have to pay the taxes with the with the points. (laughs) But um, but so that planted a very strong seed, really, for your business idea. So 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 tell us, how did I fly flat come about? So I was doing uh, points as a hobby before. And as a hobby, you can only do so much. But when, I guess, in between jobs, you do have this time to think about. And when I was thinking about all the skills I had and the fact that I knew things about points that other people didn't know and the fact that business class was expensive back then and is even more expensive today, if I could help them fly for cheap, then I must be able to charge a fee because they save me money and I'm deploying my skills. So I thought, well, why not give her a crack? Why not? Why not try? Because if people want to fly, which people do, then there must be something in it. And that, and that literally just before I went on a flight to uh, to Paris uh, in London, I Fly Flat was a name I, I, I dreamt up literally just before going to bed. I Fly Flat, that's a great name. So I quickly went to my computer to check if that domain name existed. And because it's such a unique word, I registered it and that's my name. 
No, I love I Fly Flat. And you know what? The funny thing is, is because, you know, I've I've known about you for a long time, Steve. And, you know, you're the I Fly Flat guy. And I thought, OK, well, that's interesting. He uses points. But I didn't think much about it until in um, it was in May, June this year. I flew from Sydney to L.A. And I thought, OK, well, that's a reasonably long flight. And so I'd like to fly premium economy. But because of because um, you know, obviously, business class would be so expensive and the flights are so expensive now, you know, after COVID. Um, but because of COVID, I had so many points that I used points to purchase a, a premium economy flight to return to L.A. And then I purchased my domestic flight separately. But then because I was able to use the points, I thought, oh, you know, th this is good. I've saved a lot of money here and it you know, isn't costing me very much to get to America at all. I wonder if I can use all my remaining points, because I had so many, to get an upgrade. And in my mind, I thought, because I've used points to get this flight, I don't think the airline will allow me to upgrade using points too. But I thought, oh, I'll give it a crack, as you mm. say. So I gave it a go and I put in the request. And lo and behold, yes, I was able to get upgraded. And then, especially on my flight back after I went to my nephew's wedding, and it was really lovely, on the way back, I pressed that button and I went all the way back. And then I thought of you because <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, oh, I'm flying flat. And then, of course, yes. I fly flat came up there. And it really it feels so good. It's worthwhile, definitely worthwhile. So so carry on. So you came up with this idea of I fly flat. So you've registered it and yes. that became your business. And I know you have a team of people working for you now and with you. So so tell me the story about how I fly flat grew. Yeah, so it first started with the idea that I met many people that they had points, but they didn't know what to do with them. They didn't know what what they could do with them. They knew that they could redeem for gift cards or iPads, but but on the flight side, just like you described, it's not great knowledge that what you can do with them. So, but for me, and, and there's accounting, you know, there's numbers. You go well if you could do something for cheaper, like don't redeem. I wouldn't redeem. 100,000 points for an iPad, I'll, I'll redeem for a business class flight because that's worth much, much more money. So that's how the sort of business started. So then we started hiring people to help do flight bookings. So people had points and we helped them to book flights with them. And because it's one of those things where it's like you're buying a house, people don't book points flights that often because they might not have that many points. They might have booked points flight once and then there'll be many years before they might accumulate enough points for another booking. So there was definitely economies of scale in expertise uh, and, and, and just doing the thing. So we started building up a team and, and that's still right now our bigger service is helping people who have points, however they accumulate them over the years, but they can't use them. We, our team will find those business classes and book them, but not an upgrade. We're actually going to find business class up front and pay for them with points. Uh, and then they, they're flying business class confirmed. So in a way, we are actually allowing people to fly business class for a fraction of the price of paying for it uh, by using our expertise to turn something which they can do themselves, but they don't know how to, or they don't have a time, or they've got other better things to do. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it does get quite complicated using points because... I know for, for one example, I was I was looking to book this flight, the, the more recent flight from Sydney to L.A. and then L.A. to Washington, D.C. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I can use all my points to do that. Oh, my God. It was going to take millions of points <laughs> to do that. And I thought, well, I don't have millions of points. But but then I realized that it was purely by accident that I thought, oh, I wonder how much it would be just to use points for that one leg and then pay for the domestic flights. And so I, I did that and I was able to do that with ease and, you know, with the shorter the shorter leg it doesn't really matter whether I get upgraded or not um or I felt not anyway uh but the longer flights that's where it really is a benefit but I only stumbled upon that and it took me ages of figuring out because I'm not very good at that sort of thing so have, if, had I come to you then you would have been able to explain it and it would have been so much easier but you know I'm thinking for people who work and travel for their work, then accumulating points is quite easy. But what about someone who doesn't travel for work, but wants to accumulate points? What would you recommend there? Yes, yeah, so it depends if they are a business owner or, or not. As a business owner, that's really easy 
because when you can pay your business bills on a credit card, then you can earn lots of points. In fact, you can actually earn a lot more points than you can ever earn by flying, for example, because depending on how big uh, people's business is, they could be spending $100,000 a year on expenses, or they could be spending $100,000 per month on expenses. So roughly every dollar you spend on paying by card, say Amex, will get you one point. And, and you can do a return business class flight to Los Angeles for about 216,000 points return. So therefore, that means that they're just going to pay $216,000 of expenses to the supplier and score a flight. And over to Europe, it's about 300,000 points. So when you sort of have a way of earning points on a repeated basis, then you can use them on a repeated basis and the world's actually your oyster. But for, for individuals who don't have lots of expenses to pay, then it's sort of the same idea, but of course, the volume and scale, the earning power is much reduced. So that means that you typically need to look out for more like bonus offers or promotions and things like that. Uh, like maybe sign up for a new credit card, that will give you 100,000 points. But definitely for business owners, they're sitting on a gold mine because they could earn 100,000 points every year on repeat or every month on repeat. And then therefore, they actually have access to use points to fly anywhere. And once you know the numbers, it's, it's terribly cheap, like so cheap that you wouldn't even believe it's true. And actually, that moment when you take off, I, I call that the moment of truth in my mind. Because if you booked a seat on points and you got on board, and you still haven't been found out, like how the hell did you get this seat for so cheap? In my mind, the moment of truth is when you take when you take off, then you're on. It's not like someone can come in and say, "Hey, why are you in this seat?" So, yes. You're sitting there with your glass of champagne, going, "Ah, oh, I did it. <laughs> I did it. That's right." No one's going to come and say, "Excuse me, sir, you're in the, you're in the wrong seat." So that's the moment of truth. And I think for most of people who do use points, they like, "Ah." Oh, that's it. I've made it. And also getting getting that upgrade and using the points to get there means that when you go to the airport, you know, you've got the lounge to use. And that's a wonderful benefit as well, especially for someone who's working, working really hard and you, know, you need to carry on and work um, before you get on the plane, while you're on the plane and having having the space and just being able to arrive at your destination fresh makes you so much more productive as well. So it's it's well worthwhile for businesses, um, for their executives who are going yeah, to travel a lot yeah. to, to treat and, uh, them well enough and get them uh, upgrades. I think everyone would like to fly business class if they could, but the key issue is the price. So the price is what makes business class outreach. But using points, the price drop a lot. So that's why people who love using points, they will never fly economy because they don't have to. If you never have to, because you've solved the price problem, then you never have to fly economy again. Uh, I, actually, I really like the whole idea when people talk about business class. I do want to add one more thing about business class is, you know the certainty that when you get on board and when you fly, it's your seat and no one can interrupt you. No one would can recline and take up your personal space and no one will walk over you to get to the toilet. It literally becomes your little sanctuary so, so you can actually work really, really hard up to that point and know that you've got at least 10 hours of peace. Mm. But if you fly economy, I'll say you don't have 10 hours of peace. Potentially, you've actually got more 10 hours of disruption because you're sitting amongst people who are going to do whatever they want to do and you're just really a passenger at that point. Yeah, yeah. There's there's so many benefits, and you're absolutely right. Knowing that no one is going to encroach on your personal space, that's huge because there's there's nothing more annoying than if if there's some someone behind you who maybe has got a child and the child decides to kick the seat a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or else there isn't enough space to put your bag because someone else has already taken that space. Whereas when you're in business class, you've got your own space Always to put space. everything. <laughs> which is which is so lovely but um no it's so much fun i've got some questions i'd like to ask you okay so if if someone was thinking about okay i want to fly flat and what i mean obviously this is your business steve so you're not going to yeah. give away all your secrets <laughs> <laughs> okay but are there uh, certain airlines that are more generous with their points than other airlines that that you would recommend 
Yeah. So every airline charges different points to fly to the same destination, just like how they will charge different dollar prices. Uh, so like generally, if you're going to go to Europe, uh, Singapore Airlines is, is slightly lower points. Uh, Virgin. So in, in order of points numbers, the, the highest will be uh, Emirates will charge the highest, uh, then Qantas, then Virgin, Singapore, and Qatar will be the lowest in the way. So, so every single airline charges slightly different points, but that's that that's just the price. That the second factor, it's which airline has seats because every airline has their own inventory of frequent flyer seats. So, if you've only got points in one airline currency, then you can only book flights through them. So, for example, a lot of people have a lot of Qantas points because they fly Qantas, everything's Qantas, which is great. But if you're trying to use Qantas once to book a seat in Qantas has no seats, then whether you have a 1 million points or 50 million points, it makes no difference. There's no reward seats available. So it's a little bit like finance. It's like diversification, if you can, that you can have points that, that can fly you on the date you want to fly because someone will have a seat. So someone, it might be a scenario where you might find a seat one way over on Singapore Airlines. In, in one way over back on Qatar, for example, because those are two airlines that happen to have seats on your chosen dates and destinations. So that's how I think about it. So some people always ask me, no, Steve, what's your favorite airline? And in, with a bit of tongue in cheek, I say the airline that has seats, <laughs> because no point having a favorite airline if I can't get onto it, because mm -hmm. I want to use my, my points. So yeah, which airline gives me the seats? That's my favorite at that yeah. time. Yeah, that makes that certainly makes a lot of sense. And that you're right; you don't have to fly to um, and from one country on the same airline. You can mm. you can very easily do it Explore. with different airlines yeah. too. Makes if you've got the points, then it makes sense. And so, what's the best way to maximize your points if you have started accumulating some? Yeah, so I think this comes down to a little bit of maths because it comes down to how uh, where you want to go. So where you want to go, uh, you can look up the calculator. It will tell you how many points you need to fly there. So say, for example, uh, Sydney to Los Angeles or Melbourne to Los Angeles. So Qantas will charge you, uh, for memory, 108,000 points. And Virgin will charge 95,000 points. So depending on where you want to go, you look up the calculator, and now you know how many points you, you need to go for. And then the next stage is, then what card or what not like, shopping partners or what type of promotions will get you either version or corners points in the example. And then it becomes a bit like a plan because if you need to know that if you want to do a return to uh, Los Angeles on Qantas, then you're looking for 216,000 points. So then you do all your activities and get all your credit cards that will that will help you earn 216,000 Qantas points. Because otherwise, if you don't do it that way, then you're going to have like, oh, 50,000 points here, 30,000 points here. But but the points they add up, they, they're all quite distinct buckets. So so generally, it all, all comes down to uh, volume. If you can earn a large number of points, then you can earn you know, a stash of Qantas, a stash of Virgin, a stash of Singapore, for example. But if, you, if you're not earning many points, then you've got to stick in one bucket mm -hmm. because otherwise, you're not going to get enough to book a flight. So that's in my mind how how to work with that equation. It seems like a plan in a way. Yeah. I think too many of us don't really plan forward when when we think about the point side of things. And um, but we plan forward about how much money we need to pay for our holidays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's always like how much money do i need not how many points do i need so it's a shift in shift. mindset isn't yes. it i'm so glad that you've been sharing all these tips because i'm sure it's going to benefit lots of people and me too which, which will be fantastic and there's there's so i could talk to you all day steve and it would be so interesting to find out more and more but now with your business it must feel so rewarding to know that you're helping businesses and helping people yeah, actually, this morning I got an email from a past client, and, and he he said he he just booked a a flight on Qatar, uh, one hundred eighty thousand points, and it cost him like nothing. And he said, "Oh, thank you for putting me onto this," and and that's like the 
great emails because then that means the customer has taken the system and utilized it and, and scored a bargain and then realized, wow, it's actually, actually opens up the world because once the problem of price and comfort is solved, then what I really like people to think about is, you know, what happens is when people fly a long way in a long distance, a, long, a, a large price, they tend to want to pack everything in. So if you go into Europe, you don't not going to go for two days because you, you've flown 24 hours. You're not going to come back in two days or you paid a lot of money. You pay $2,000 for economy or maybe 15 for business class. You're not going to go for two days. But then that means that you try to do one week, two weeks, three weeks, but then you don't have three weeks. So you go, oh, I'll go next year and I'll go next year. So, so all the trips get put off. But if the problem of price and comfort is solved, then the whole idea is that you could go for two days and go to your friend's wedding or birthday or 50th anniversary or whatever and come back and not knowing that you had to like make it all happen at the same time. And, and that's what I want to help my classes do because then you got the freedom to go whenever. And what I do know uh, with all my heart is every trip you take, you never come back going, oh, that was a waste of time. You always come back going, oh, that was so good. Mm -hmm. So true. You know what? This has come full circle, Steve, because from your early days of wanting to take psychology, you don't need a psychology degree. You already understand people so well and what drives them. And I think especially after those several years of COVID, the meaning of travel has become so important to people and you're enabling that. So thank you so much for sharing all these wonderful insights. It's been absolutely amazing. And I need to tell people, all you need to do is to Google I fly flat and you'll find Steve. And if you go to Instagram, I fly flat, flat, you'll, you'll find Steve as well. In fact, just go to Google and you'll find every single social media platform um, and reach out to Steve and, you know, have a chat too, because you, it was so lovely to speak to. And it's very nice for anyone who's watching the video. The view from Steve's office is magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> it's like i'm flying <laughs> it is it is it's wonderful well thank you so much for your time steve i really really appreciate it thank you very much i love talking